I'm 55. My heart is not in great condition, so, well, my life won't be very long. This means that I will probably leave this valley of tears before the official historic documents about the Russian missile production will be released. And reading those is a reason good enough to try and live till that day. On the night of the 21st of September 2023, the Russian armed forces launched a strike aimed at Ukrainian energy and logistic facilities. An Iskander attack hit a tank repair facility in the Kharkiv area with apparently a single missile. A drone was there to film the strike and no air defense systems seemed to be active in the area. A hotel supposed to host foreign military personnel was hit in Cherkasy, and the day before they attacked the oil refinery in Kremenchung. In the same night in the Kyiv area, which is supposed to be one of the most protected, another time the pole was hit. The airport in Venezia, hosting the Su-24s modified to launch the Storm Shadows, was hit and some of the aircraft were hit as well. A power distribution facility was hit in Rovna, near the nuclear plant. Another oil facility was hit in Lviv, in the far west of Ukraine. And a few other targets were hit the same night, unfortunately causing collateral damage too. According to Ukrainian sources, the Russian Air Force launched 43 cruise missiles, plus at least one Iskander, plus, we are told, S-300 launched in ballistic trajectories. We don't know if Garan 2 drones were involved, but, well, it's likely. The Ukrainians claim to have shot down 36 of the 43 cruise missiles, but, well, the entity of the damage casts doubts on this claim. In the following day, the Russian Air Force, the Navy and the Army has successfully executed several long-range strikes, mostly in southern Ukraine, targeting high-paying targets and the sites originating the Ukrainian attacks in the naval theater. Why I'm telling you this? Because Russia had run out of missiles several times, starting more than a year ago, and they regularly keep running out of missiles. Understanding the Russian missile production is extremely difficult, and we are left piecing together what fragments of information we have. Economic data are of little use in this case because we don't have disaggregated numbers. Uh, sure, Russia has announced a large increase of the military budget, but we don't know how much is going into missiles. We know of some contracts for some categories of military equipment, uh, but nothing official about missiles. Checking corporate results, even if they were available at the detail we need, wouldn't help either. This is wartime and the Russian military industrial complex, which is almost entirely state-owned, is almost certainly working with no margins. But let's begin from the start. Since February 2022, Russia has fired about 6,000 missiles and loitering munitions. The actual number changes almost every day, so it doesn't really make sense trying to be more precise. In the opening hours of the so-called Special Military Operation, Russia hit 160 targets in Ukraine with long-range weapons and airstrikes. Many targets, like airfields, were hit by salvos of half a dozen weapons or more. And we also know that the Russians used several decoys to activate Ukrainian air defenses. It was an effective strike, but two crucial results were not achieved. The destruction of the Ukrainian air defenses and the neutralization of the Ukrainian air force, because aircraft and air defenses had been moved and dispersed in the territory. The survival of the Ukrainian air defenses will turn out to have a tremendous impact on the rest of the war, keeping the VKS mostly outside Ukrainian airspace. This meant that the weight of the air campaign was borne mostly by the long-range weapons, either air, sea or ground launched. In April 2022, the focus shifted from military targets to strategic targets of economic relevance, most likely because it became apparent that the conflict was going to last much longer than expected. In this stage, the focus shifted on oil and gas facilities, factories and communication infrastructures. And while the Ukrainian productive capability was indeed progressively destroyed, the attacks on oil, gas and communications did not have a particular effect. 
roads and railways were quickly rebuilt and the refined petroleum products were imported. From the 10th of October 2022, shortly after the appointment of Shurovikin as the theater commander, the Russians changed tack again. On that day alone, more than 100 missiles hit the power grid infrastructures all over Ukraine. In the first week, 405 targets were hit, including 45 power stations. In the autumn of 2022, about 600 cruise missiles and 700 loitering munitions were used, often launching waves of about 100 weapons. The damage was severe and the impact on the activities supporting the war was not negligible. Ukraine avoided the complete collapse of the power grid only thanks to foreign aid. Long-range attacks became less frequent and with fewer weapons during the spring and summer of 2023. The loitering munitions became a higher and higher percentage of the attacks, even if specific targets kept being targeted with high-end weapons. In particular, the Russians tried to selectively hit bridges and communication choke points between Ukraine and Romania because an increasing percentage of the supplies now flow from the southern frontier. Today, it seems that the Russians have sort of consolidated this procedure of always using a mix of different weapons in waves, where high-end systems operate together with low-end loitering munitions. And actually, I think that the term loitering munition is not really appropriate. Weapons like the Garand 2 are de facto low-end or light cruise missiles, because despite having a small warhead, they make an unexpectedly large boom. And this brings us to the recent few days and weeks where the attacks seem to be ramping up again, this time focusing on the Ukrainian centers of gravity and high pain targets. So overall, while the Russian missile campaign has surely caused a lot of damage to the Ukrainian war effort, it has failed to achieve a decisive impact. And let's see why. First, there is a strategic reason. The Russians do not hit the targets at the root of the Ukrainian war effort. They do not hit the logistics centers in Poland, the tank factories in Germany, uh, the training fields in the UK, the material depot and the intelligence centers in the US. And nobody wants that, of course. In fact, Ukraine, on a limited scale, has started hitting targets in Russia, while Russia still doesn't hit targets in NATO territory to avoid escalation. Ukraine has a sanctuary, but Russia doesn't. Second, the general strategic mistake made by Russia at the beginning of the invasion influenced the air campaign too. Russia was convinced that Ukrainian forces would not have fought, that the invasion would be over quickly with little resistance. Not enough units were committed, some were just police units, and the logistic chains were not set up. Planning was rushed or inaccurate, the combat units were notified at most 72 hours before the operation, uh, there was no central commander, and so on. So, basically, a complete mess. A mess that influenced the entire campaign, and it is the main reason why the hostilities are now at basically a stalemate. Some observers also point out that the scale of the missile and air attacks at the beginning of the war was largely insufficient, given the number of objectives in a country like Ukraine. I personally agree. The view of some analysts is that the Russians severely underestimated the number of weapons that was necessary for a knockout strike, but I personally believe that in the context of the Russian strategic assessment at the beginning of the war, which was wrong, the idea was to limit the damage to the Ukrainian defensive infrastructure. When the realization that the war was going to be a long-term affair sunk in, it was too late. The Ukrainian air defenses were active, the Ukrainian air forces was doing what it could, and a good portion of the inventory, the best portion of the inventory, was already used. Another factor that diminished the effectiveness of the missile strikes was the poor targeting. There is evidence that the information used by the Russians to target their cruise and ballistic missiles, particularly in the fateful first few days, was outdated. A noteworthy example was a few weapons wasted on a storage area where unserviceable MiG-29s were parked. And this seemed to be mainly an Air Force and Navy problem, uh, since the Army long-range weapons like the Skander, even in those first days, reacted much more quickly and accurately. 
Today, it seems that the kill chains have shortened and the targeting is much more accurate. It took many months to deploy and integrate the ISR assets that now allow them to control the battlefield in depth with sufficient accuracy. And it is really notable how the Russians are now capable of filming the strikes with drones a few hundred kilometers inside the Ukrainian territory. This means that their reconnaissance drones can effectively evade Ukrainian air defenses. Then there is also consideration to do about the accuracy of the weapons used. Some of the Russian weapons, like the missiles of the Kaliber and KH-101 family, demonstrated a great accuracy with minimal circular error probability when fired against the right targets. But other weapons, not so much. For example, the Russians used S-300 surface-to-air missiles and 3M-55 Onyx anti-ship missiles to hit ground targets. This was interpreted as a lack of resources in the West, but Russian weapons are often designed for dual use. However, the S-300, in its secondary mission, is not an accurate weapon because the missile is radio-guided by the operator and it lacks terminal guidance. The old KH-22 anti-ship missile that has been used in few units against ground targets has a terminal guidance, but being an anti-ship missile has the tragic tendency to lock onto the wrong target. These weapons, when used against targets nearby populated areas, cause quite a large of collateral damage, but even this is changing because in S-300, recently recovered by the Ukrainians, additional GPS and GLONASS navigation modules were found, so we may safely assume that that type of guidance is now available in air-to-ground use. Obviously, the presence of air defenses is another reason why the effectiveness of the cruise missiles is limited. With the progressive introduction of Western system, the overall Ukrainian capability has increased and the percentage of intercepts has increased as well. Now, most of the Ukrainian claims which are the basis for various Western analyses are not credible. There have been a few cases where the claimed intercepts were more than missiles launched or claims of 100% intercepts and at the same time reports of targets hit inside Ukraine. I believe that part of this mismatch is due to genuine errors caused by the coins that are hit being mistaken for actual weapons. Part is due to propaganda to support the civilian population morale and try confusing the Russian intelligence. I can't tell what is wrong and what is right, but it seems that a 50-60% air defense success is realistic on average and in line with the results that we are seeing on the field. So, as we have seen, there is a number of reasons that limited the effectiveness of the Russian missile offensive, but why are they using missiles in the first place? So, the Russian Air Force has a top line of about 1,000 combat aircraft. These should be enough to bury Ukraine under a hailstorm of fire. So, why are they not doing it? Why long-range weapons are doing all the work? The reason goes back again to the first days of the invasion and the unbelievable strategic mistake at the beginning of the operations. When the most modern Ukrainian air defenses managed to survive and when the Russians realized that their CAD capabilities were not adequate, they basically decided to avoid entering the Ukrainian airspace. Thanks to the long-range ground-based and air launch missiles, they kept Ukrainian air force at a distance from the line of contact, but they did not venture beyond it. During the first days, the Russians did indeed operate in depth within Ukraine, but they soon retired and never attacked again. So all the weight of the strategic air campaign was left to the missiles, because they were much more abundant and survivable than piloted platform. But there's more. There is a doctrinal reason. As I said several times, attracting the execration of many, the Russian Air Force is mainly a defensive force. The Soviets planned large offensive missions over Europe, but the Russians focused on the defense of their airspace. The air-to-ground mission took the backseat for a long time. However, the Russian idea of defense is putting the opponent in conditions of not being capable of effectively attacking which means that they do not plan to sit under their defenses, they plan to conduct offensive operations to degrade the opponent's offensive capability. Degrading a force to the point that is no longer capable of attacking is much easier 
than conquering territory or trying to destroy everything. And in this context, the weapon that they choose for long-range operation were the missiles. In fact, the Soviets and the Russians always loved long-range, big and fast missiles, so it was a natural choice. In three decades, they developed several modern and effective systems, and in this war we have learned that they had many more than everyone was expecting. So this brings us to the original question. How many do they have? How many are they producing? In November 2022, the Ukrainian Defense Minister released a detailed assessment of how many missiles Russia had left derived from a study of Ukrainian intelligence. According to this estimate, Russia still had about 500 long-range cruise missiles. By January 2023, the estimate was already outdated. So in January, the assessment was modified to the Russians have enough weapons for three to five 80 missiles attack. By March, it was already outdated. Then other claims started to emerge from the analysis of the serial numbers of the wrecks recovered by the Ukrainians. It seems that the Russians were launching weapons built just two or three months earlier, suggesting that the stockpiles were nearly exhausted. This is a reasonable claim, but let me tell you a short story. So, in 1944, during the weeks before and after the D-Day, one of the concerns of the Allied forces was the German Tiger tank. It was a concern because it was considered technically way superior to the American and British tanks, and even a small number of them on the battlefield could have been a serious threat. The Tiger and the Panther, which was considered similarly dangerous, had been seen in Tunisia and Italy already, and the danger that they represented was well known. So it was important to understand how many tanks were produced. The aero reconnaissance, the field reports and the human intelligence pointed to relatively high numbers. But then someone had the idea of collecting the serial numbers on the mechanical parts. Analyzing these numbers, it was possible to estimate that the units produced were way fewer than the other methods predicted. When at the end of the war, the actual numbers became available, the analysis of the serial numbers resulted the closest to the real number. Now, there is no intelligence officer in the world who never heard of this story. So, if I was involved in a war where the enemy is constantly analyzing the wrecks of my weapons, the first thing I would do would be start messing with the serials. Mind, it is possible to understand if the Russians are messing with the serials. Uh, Google the Benford's law if you want to learn more. But so far, I've seen no analysis trying to ascertain the validity of this approach. And this is the reason why I am always suspicious of all the analyses that rely on marking and serials, which are the great passion of some analysts. Well, I hope that now it is clear how nobody outside Russia has the faintest idea of how many missiles Russia has and how many missiles they are producing. Ponderous analyses have been produced, but Russia managed to surprise everyone. So I put it here. The answer to the question, how many long-range ground attack missiles is Russia producing is, we don't know, but it is probably more than you expect. I personally can't say a number either, but it's definitely more than a few dozen weapons a month that you see in most analyses. To say the same thing in more cultured terms, the availability of long-range ground attack missiles is not going to be a limiting factor for the Russian capabilities in the foreseeable future. Anyway, stay here because we have some more considerations on this subject. The first consideration is that I think, together with some analysts, that the Russians are keeping a reserve in case of escalation with NATO. At least a few hundred weapons to execute an initial attack on the main air bases. This is the same logic that explains why we have seen the Russians fly so little and be so risk averse with their air force. Another consideration is that you never really run out of missiles. When the reserves approach a certain level, the usage slows down and the remaining weapons are used more sparingly, matching the target and the weapon more accurately. At the same time, with a dwindling supply, alternatives will be found. We have already seen the introduction of the Garand II as a measure to spare some of the more capable weapons, when necessary, as a consequence of the excessive consumption in the first year of war. 
and new weapons will also be introduced. For example, there is a new medium weight cruise missile probably being introduced as we speak. We will probably see the first this year, that is the KH-50. It's not a cheap and simple weapon. It is actually expected to be a semi-stealth, quite sophisticated uh, system with a number of features to penetrate contested air spaces. I'm sure we won't see large numbers at the beginning, but this means that there will be a new assembly line producing weapons that, in theory, should be less vulnerable to air defenses. So, these weapons will likely never run out, but their usage and their mix will be rearranged to address the conditions of the moment. Some will point out that the Russian weapons do contain several Western components. These will eventually run out because of the sanctions and the production will stop. We have already discussed this extensively, so I won't go through it again. The foreign components are essentially integrated circuits, and for most of them, it's very difficult to stop the import. Moreover, Russia has an indigenous production, albeit not as sophisticated as it would be necessary. Moreover, Russia has access to Chinese imports. So the natural process of substitution, if imports become unavailable, may indeed happen. It won't be painless, it will require redesign of components, but it may happen. Now, I have to confess something. When I started looking into this subject, not just the missiles, I mean the whole Russian economy and production, I was genuinely convinced that the results would have been different. I was convinced that the Russian military industrial complex was declining, but I was wrong. If you have seen the previous videos about the Russian economy and the war industrial mobilization, you will have realized how the situation is nowhere near being critical, but it is actually improving. The only comment I would add is that it is tragic that this is happening because of a war. Now, I'm well aware that there are indeed problems and where the military economy is flourishing, some areas of the civilian production, like the automotive, are suffering quite badly. I'm well aware that substitution are happening slowly and we have some anecdotal evidence that they are barely adequate. I'm well aware that the Russian defense companies are struggling to find qualified personnel and they are somewhat in competition with the armed forces which are undergoing a constant expansion. But overall the Russian military industrial complex can sustain the effort and it really seems that Russia won't run out of missiles anytime soon. In this video I spared you all the intricacies related to the various expansions and contracts. There is a flurry of news on Russian media or internet corporate sites where companies and plans announce hiring new employees, production increases, new contract announcements and so on. New large production plants are being established and the case of the Geran 2 is paradigmatic and it would deserve a long video on its own. Maybe one day we will do it. Those who support the channel on Patreon or by being a member will receive, as I usually do, the list of the sources that I use and they will be free to follow the rabbit hole of the expansion of Novator, the new shifts at Raduga, the contracts at Vimpel and so on. Just one word of caution. For intellectual correctness, in the sources I added a few analyses that point in a direction opposite. I did not debunk them openly because I think that if you don't have anything nice to say, just stay silent and smile. Those who support the channel can judge for themselves. And for all the others, I really hope you enjoyed this video. So if you like this video, please do all the usual YouTube stuff, uh, subscribe, uh, like, hit the bell and so on. If you could support the channel by being a member on Patreon or one of donations, I would be incredibly grateful, as I am enormously grateful to all those who are already supporting the channel. And this is it. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.